Thanks, everyone. It's, it's, it's really wonderful to be here. And the, the, the first thing I want to say is that I, uh, I have four daughters. So I am so used to talking and talking and just have people going on with their lives. So uh, what that means is if you need to get up and get a drink or a dessert or whatever you, by all means, I'm, like I say, I'm, I'm so used to just talking and people just going on with their lives. Uh, the other reason I'm so happy to be here is I, I, I grew up uh, outside of Birmingham. And uh, I've been up north for so long that my, my family certainly considers me a Yankee. But I, I, it, it's wonderful to be back where my name, Ben, has its proper two syllables. So it's, uh, it, 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 it's really glad, really, really happy to be back here. Now, the only thing I, I want to mention about Salient, Salient manages about $13 billion. Uh, it's headquartered in Houston. Uh, and its focus is on uh, uh, real assets. And so that's all I have to say about Salient. But if that's your interest, we'll, we can talk about that. Uh, we can skip this. And I want to get right to the meat of the, 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 the program today. Uh, this is a famous painting by the famous artist of the American West, Frederick Remington. And it's hanging in the, uh, the Eamon Carter Museum uh, out in Fort Worth which is one of America's great museums, uh, if you ever get a chance to, uh, to, to, to go see it. But this was, this was Remington's uh, answer to a question that has been perplexing human beings for probably 10,000 years. And the question is this. When a horse gallops, do all four of its hooves leave the ground at the same time? Now, you would think we would have an easy answer to that. We've, as human beings, we've been riding and racing and horses and galloping on horses, like I say, for thousands of years. But if you go to the track, or, you know, you watch a horse race, you can't quite tell. You think that the answer is, as Remington is describing here, that, that yes, all four hooves leave the ground when the horse gallops. And, and you think it happens when the horse is, is kind of flying through the air. And that, of course, was the the common knowledge of the day, and that's what, what, what Remington is presenting here in this, in this, this famous painting. And what I'm here to tell you is this is fake news. Uh, now, there was a, a, an aficionado of the sport of kings uh, by the name of Leland Stanford. Uh, this is after the American Civil War. This is really right about the same time. It was actually a few years before uh, uh, Remington painted his, uh, his, his painting. Leland Stanford, this is the Stanford of Stanford University. He was the uh, governor of California. He was an extremely wealthy man. Uh, really called, consider him the, the, the billionaire venture capitalist of the day. right? Because what, what's always fascinating to me is how history does lie. And that as we have Silicon Valley today and the Bay Area where you have both the venture capitalist and the, the, the technology uh, inventors, it was exactly the same thing uh, after the, the, the U.S. Civil War in the uh, 1870s and 1880s. So Leland Stanford, as rich people are often wont to do, said one day, I guess he woke up and said, hey, I will spend whatever it takes to answer this question once and for all. Do all four of a horse's hooves leave the ground when a horse gallops? So what he did, as billionaire uh, investors would do today, he went around the bay up to San Francisco, with this weird looking dude on the right, Edward Mybridge uh, had set up a studio. Uh, Mybridge was an inventor. Uh, he invented a technology we now know as stop action photography. Uh, Mybridge, as the picture suggests, was a really wacky dude, right? And so he had moved to San Francisco, again, then as now, to reinvent himself. Uh, and he received Leland Stanford in his studio, and Stanford said, I will pay you whatever it takes for you to use your technology to, to answer this question for me. Now, the whatever it takes ended up being a lot. Uh, there was a murder trial where Mybridge shot in the chest his, uh, his young wife's lover. Uh, Stanford got him off scot-free. It was kind of the, the OJ trial of the day. Uh, and in fact, it, I mean, it was such a crazy life that, that Philip Glass wrote an opera about, uh, about Mybridge and, and, and Stanford. It's, it's, it's really a, an amazing story. But here's the answer. Here's the answer for how a horse runs. And you can see that the, the answer is that yes, all four of a horse's hooves do in fact leave the ground when a horse gallops, but not in that 
lying position, not in that outstretched position. In that outstretched position, at least one hoof is touching the ground at all times. Instead, the, the four hooves leave the ground in that very unromantic, tucked in position, top row, second from the right. And what I find amazing about this, and then all the thousands of years that human beings have been racing and riding horses, galloping horses, no one had ever posited that that was the answer. And I, I would suggest to you that the reason where for thousands of years no one posited that as the answer, and instead, even after this, these pictures were, were published, Remington painted his painting after this was, this was, uh, this was published, is that it's, it's a very unromantic truth. Uh, it's a very awkward position. And instead, it's much more romantic to have a narrative, a story, that a horse flies through the air when it gallops. Uh, but it's not true. Now, what I also want to suggest to you is that what, what Mybridge had invented with stop action photography was, in many ways, the first, one of the first examples of artificial intelligence. Because what artificial intelligence is, uh, is a way to use technology to visualize, to process what we call unstructured data. Things, uh, a photograph, uh, a recording, uh, the words that we hear, the, 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 the sights that we see. That's what artificial intelligence is. It doesn't operate on structured data. It won't make your regressions run any faster. It won't give you better answers to your Excel function. Right? Instead, what artificial intelligence is, and I really can't emphasize this strongly enough, is a powerful way to process or visualize the world uh, in terms of unstructured data. And because it allows us to do this, because it allows us humans to see things that we couldn't otherwise see, that we couldn't otherwise visualize the way a machine can, whether it's a series of cameras or whether it's a series of, of processors, uh, it, what AI allows us to do is to ask better questions. And, and, and that's a, it's a, it's an enormously powerful instrument. But we have to be prepared when the answers to those questions are terribly unromantic. And so here I want to show you, and this is the, this is the graph that, that always gets me in trouble at, at, at CFA meetings, uh, because here is a very unromantic truth. That green line you see there, that's our old friend, the S&P 500. It's the, the, this chart is starting in March of 2009 when the Federal Reserve began its a quantitative easing program when they started buying stuff. And as we're all familiar with the S&P 500, that uh, index has quadrupled uh, in the intervening nine years. Uh, the blue line, on the other hand, that blue line is an investable index that, that the Deutsche Bank puts out. It's their quality index. It's a market neutral index that is trying to capture this factor that we all in this room, certainly myself, believe in. That is the notion that, that the quality matters. And while the S&P 500 has quadrupled up close to 300%, actually more than 300% now uh, in these years, that quality index, that market neutral quality index is up not 2.5% per year, but a total over nine years of 2.57% total. It has been absolutely freaking useless for you as investors. Now, look, quality for sure is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. I get, I get that. But this index is actually, I think, a pretty good proxy for what most of us innately think when we're thinking about quality. Right, so what, what they what they look at to construct the index, they take a thousand large cap global companies, they evaluate them on return on invested capital, return on equity, accounting accruals, and then they, uh, they, they, they take the top 20%, the top 200 companies, and they go long those companies. They buy those companies an equally weighted amount, and they go short the companies that score lowest on this measure, also an equally weighted amount. So again, market neutral. And that's what you get. That's what you get here. Now, I'll tell you, if you put up a value factor, a market neutral value factor, right, it's going to look even worse than that. But I chose quality because I, I really think quality is the bias that we all share. 
and, and, and I, I use that word bias advisedly, but we all believe in our heart of hearts that our job as investors, both for our own money and as stewards for our clients' money, is that we should be seeking out companies that have strong management teams, uh, growing earnings, a uh, fortress balance sheet, and we should be avoiding companies that don't. We should be going long quality and we should be avoiding or shorting the crap. And what this chart, this is just the truth, and I think all of us in this room recognize this is the truth, is that quality has not mattered for nine years. Yeah, for nine years. And I've got to tell you, this, this is why active management is today failing. Let's be honest. As a business, our business models based on active management are failing because whether you're a hedge fund guy or whether you're a private equity guy or whether you're a, uh, a, a stock trader or whether you're a long-term investor, your insights, your bias towards quality has added no value to your client's portfolio for nine years. It's not that your quality stocks haven't gone up, right? But they've gone up exactly as much as the crap stocks, right? The, the stocks have gone up, but not because of their quality-ness. And that is the struggle that every active manager in the world has wrestled with for nine years. And so I'm here to tell you there's hope. Although hope is not a terribly effective strategy. So it, I, it's, uh, I think the, to get to the conclusion here, I think there are some things that are changing. But there are also some differences in our world that I think will make it very difficult to go back to the way things were. So my question is, you know, forget about horses. How does a market run without quality? And that's what I want to talk about. I want to try to use some of these new tools that are available to us to try to give us an answer, even if the answer is uncomfortable or unromantic. Now, now, now part of the answer, for sure, for how a market runs without quality is that since 2008, the world's central banks have bought stuff, trillions of dollars worth of stuff, typically fixed income instruments, although some central banks whether it's Japan or the Swiss National Bank actually buy equities. But whether, wherever you're buying, right, it's a, it's, a, it's a tide that lifts all boats. Then what you're seeing here, these are the four largest central banks. So you've got the US Federal Reserve, you've got the European uh, Central Bank, the ECB, you've got the Bank of Japan, you've got the Bank of China. That top line is their cumulative balance sheet, the, the, the amount of stuff that they own. And you see that these four Central banks now own more than 20 trillion, trillion with a T, dollars worth of stuff. Right? That is a phenomenal change in the way our world of investment works. Uh, and, and, and certainly one aspect of this is that the central banks, when they are buying stuff, they're not trying to reward good companies and punish bad companies. They could not care less about quality or value or anything else. What they're trying to do is accomplish this. They want to be the tide that lifts all boats. And they have certainly succeeded with that. Now here's where I'm going to say there's some hope, right? Because what all these central banks are doing, most notably the US Federal Reserve, which is actually now starting to shrink its balance sheet, but all these central banks are at least slowing down their purchases right, and are moving towards actually, again, shrinking their own balance sheets. Now, there's a lot of shrinking to go when you've got $20 trillion worth of stuff that these banks own. And, and please, these banks, it's, it's as Jim Grant likes to say when he's talking about the Swiss National Bank, you know, the Swiss National Bank is one of the largest shareholders of Apple, of Apple stock. And so the money they've used, the Swiss francs they've used to purchase Apple stock, as Jim Grant says, it's just constructed out of the thin alpine air. Uh, so, so all of this money is, is, is new, right? There's nothing behind it. There's nothing backing it. It's just, oh, we're going to give ourselves money and we are going to buy stuff with it. So that's what's been going on and it, that's, a, that's a lot to work off, but at least the, the accelerating increase these central bank balance sheets is no longer taking place. 
and will start to level off and then ultimately will start to decline. So that, that's what gives me some hope, right, that active management can matter again, that quality can matter again, because if you don't have this wall of money plowing into capital markets every single month, 100, 200 billion dollars, well, you won't have this tide that lifts all boats. And hopefully, advisedly, then in that sort of world where you don't have the tide lifting all boats, then quality will matter again. That's the hope. But here's what's changed in the world. Here's the, here's the bell we're not going to, to, to unring. Even if we can undo all of this, which can take decades, of course, to accomplish, right? there's one thing that we're never going to undo. And that's the degree to which everyone, including central bankers in particular, now use their words to change our behavior. I'll say that again. The way they use their words to change our behavior. This is not a tinfoil hat conspiracy idea. This is, this is what the Federal Reserve calls, and they have committees for this, and it's an avowed part of their, their toolkit. They call it communication policy. They call it forward guidance, right? When Bernanke, in his, his last, his last uh, speech as Fed chair, it's amazing what people will say in their last speech, right? Uh, the truth they'll tell in their last speech, where, you know, George Washington said, oh, you know, watch out for those entangling alliances. You know, stay away from Europe, right? Or Dwight Eisenhower in his last speech said, well, watch out for that military-industrial complex. Right, so when, when freaking Dwight Eisenhower is telling you to watch out for the military-industrial complex, I mean, that's, that's interesting. What, what Bernanke said in his last speech as Fed chair, he said, look, I've had eight years. The last war had not been fun. Um, it, what we did, you know, when we had this crisis, uh, we addressed it with the tools we had. And the first toolkit we had was to take our interest rates down to zero, which we did immediately. Uh, we didn't know at the time that you could take interest rates into negative territory, you know, go figure. But, uh, but, but we, we exhausted that toolkit. Then we went to our second toolkit, which was buying stuff, quantitative easing, expanding our balance sheet. It said, I, I, I think that the first time we did it in March of 2009, it was highly effective. I agree. I think the Fed saved the world in March of 2009. But Bernanke went on to say, and I also agree with this, that, well, QE2 didn't do anything, really not in the real economy. And QE3 and et cetera, we actually think it was counterproductive. This, this has been Bernanke talking. But he said we weren't getting the, the results we wanted. So we can't buy stuff, well, so what tool could we use? And that's when he said, well, look, we developed this third toolkit and it's worked out so much better than we ever thought it would. This is why we have the Fed governors give interviews. This is why you'll see a Fed governor on CNBC you know, every other day. Um, you know, none of that happened before. None of that happened before. But we do it now because it's part of communication policy. It's to use our words not to describe what we really think about the world, but to use our words to try to change your behavior. You know, what we might call lying under other circumstances. Uh, and and this, this, this is the, the, the bell that can't be unrung. Because this is the thing, something that politicians have known forever. Politicians have known how to, uh, what game theory calls the spur of the common knowledge game. Politicians have known this for thousands of years. But, but now everyone's in on the act. And in particular, the actors who are so influential in our world, the central bankers, they've now got this. They've now got this. Now, there's a, but there's a way that this works. And so this, this is how I want to try to take the conversation now. What we call these people in game theory, we call them missionaries. Because just like a missionary, what, the, the way you construct common knowledge, the way you get this sort of story out there and to, to change our behavior, is that you, you, you get behind a big microphone, not like this, but a big media megaphone, and you shake your finger at people. Literally, you shake your finger at people. And I, I, I made this slide, I just typed in these people's names plus finger pointing. And I, I Be, because what you're trying to accomplish here is you're not trying to tell people the facts. Right? You're not trying to tell people the truth with a capital T about the world or about what you think. You're trying to construct, let's call it fake news. What I like to call it fiat news. 
right? In the same way you have fiat currencies, well, let's just run the printing press and here's some money. In the same way we do that, we can just say anything of an opinion and turn that into news, into fact. And the way you do that, again, is not by saying to people what happened, but you shake your finger at them and you try to tell them how to think about the world. You're not telling them what to think. You're not telling them the facts. You're trying to tell them how to interpret the facts, how to think about the world. That's what people do when they shake their finger at you. Now, of course, today we have our finger pointer in chief, our missionary in chief. And, and it, I've, I've got Trump up here, right? Because I don't care what you think about his politics. What I want you to recognize is that he is a phenomenal player of this game. And we all think we're immune to this stuff, right? We all think that, oh, no, 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 I, I'm too smart to be you know, impacted by people shaking their finger at us and telling us how to think about the world. You're not. I'm not. We are hardwired to respond to this. And the way it works, the way in which we're hardwired to respond to it, it's not that we particularly find this guy particularly believable or, or any of the people on the prior page particularly believable. What we find totally believable is when we look around at the crowd that is also hearing the story. So the way that these, these narratives the, the, are constructed requires two things. One, it requires the missionary, right? Somebody to get behind that megaphone. And it's, it's just anybody famous, right, to be a famous investor. When Warren Buffett is on CNBC, he's a missionary. Let me tell you, Warren Buffett is shaking his finger at you any time he appears. It's any politician who's any decent. It's Elon Musk today when they had their, their, their Tesla shareholder meeting. I'll come back to that one, right? But it's, getting by, it's a famous person getting behind that, that, that megaphone, shaking their finger at you, telling you how to think about the world. And the crowd hearing the message, not necessarily looking at the, the, the missionary, but looking around at each other. It's the power of the crowd watching the crowd. This is why we have laugh tracks on sitcoms. You will respond more positively to that TV show when you hear the crowd laughing. You're hardwired to respond to it. This is why you know, Dick Clark, he, he died a few years back with an estate of about $800 million. Dick Clark did really well for himself. And the, the, his real secret of success was American Bandstand. I think most of you are familiar with that, with that show. Where Dick Clark in the, in the 50s and the 60s he told middle America what music they liked. And amazingly enough, it was music that Dick Clark represented. Yeah, go figure, right? And the way he did it, it wasn't like some East European, you know, ministry of culture with a K, you know, that says, you will like the polka, right? No, 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 it's, it's actually much easier than that. What Dick Clark did is he picked out the music that he would get a cut off, and he hired a bunch of young, attractive people to respond positively to that, to be the crowd that would respond positively to that music. Uh, it's got a good beat, you can dance to it, Dick, and give it a 97. And they got a TV show on ABC, and the rest is history. Because we are literally hardwired to watch the crowd. And you know, I was talking about how good Donald Trump is at playing this game. This is why Donald Trump is so consumed and it's smart. This is, I'm telling you, this, it's, it's, it's really, I, I don't know if it's because of his reality TV experience or what, but it's so smart. Next time he gives a campaign speech or you know, speaking to a crowd, just, just watch. The first comment he'll make is about the crowd. He'll talk about how big the crowd is, what great ratings we're getting. Right? Always. Because it forces then the crowd to look at itself and say, oh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's why, you know, he was so evidently consumed with the idea that more people were at his inauguration than any inauguration in the past, you know, despite, you know, you know, obvious evidence to the contrary, right? It didn't matter, right? It's incredibly effective at changing our behaviors, either as investors or as citizens, because we're all looking at the crowd and we're watching how the crowd reacts. <laughs> No, the, the media, like I say, this has been around for a long time. Nobody's inventing something new. So media barons have known forever the power of creating that story and that narrative. 
This is William Randolph Hearst. He was the, uh, the case study for Citizen Kane. Uh, and you know, the most famous example of this for Hearst, you know, prior to him running for, for governor of New York, was that uh, you know, he created the story around the Spanish-American War, which was Remember the Maine, the battleship that uh, blew up and sank in Havana Harbor. Now, as a problem in the boiler room, there was nothing, there was no mal, you know, it was an accident. It was. Clearly, it was an accident. But the story was, it was the Spanish, they snuck aboard somehow and they blew up our battleship. Remember the main, the casas belli, the cause of war, the reason for war. Right? So this has been around forever, and media barons have known how to do this for, I say, for a long time. Today is the same way. Today is exactly the same way. Right, this is why Mark Zuckerberg went on his listening tour of America, right, where he posted all these, you know, his, his team would come over and take photographs of him. Mark Zuckerberg giving, giving milk to a calf, right, or talking to a race car driver. Right? This, this went on for months, and it is happening because he's been derailed about the, in this a little bit, but Zuckerberg's going to run for politics. He's going to run for political office. Um, and, it, and it's a matter of creating that story because he knows what an important property megaphone that he has in Facebook. That's why Jeff Bezos personally, not through Amazon, but personally bought the Washington Post. And not because I think Bezos has any intention of getting into politics, but because he understands that being able to create a narrative to shape and influence the stories is what you must do to acquire and preserve wealth today. That's why it was the Washington Post. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but put, but, but put this, this, this one up. So on the, on the left, that's Jeff Bezos about 15 years ago when he was like a, only a single digit billionaire. And on the right, that's, that's, that's Jeff uh, as, a, as a hundred, as a centa billionaire, uh, about 15 years older. I mean, whatever Jeff is taking, I want some of that. <laughs> so, I, think, I think the HGH looks pretty good on him. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. Couldn't resist, couldn't resist, right? You know, as interestingly for us in this room, the street has known about this forever too, the power of creating stories and the way in which all of us in this room, including myself, are hardwired to respond to this stuff. So, you know, here are the robber, some of the robber barons, you know, Carnegie, got Jay Gould who cornered the, the gold market in the 1870s. You've got the Commodore, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt there. My, my point here is that, is that really if you read any memoir or any uh, recounting of what it meant to be an investor uh, prior to World War II, what you find is that nobody is talking about fundamentals. Nobody is talking about free cash flow models. Right? What they are talking about and what these three guys were masters of is creating a story. What they would call a corner. You know, so we still talk about cornering the market. That's what comes from this notion of creating a story it would give you this edge that would change the behavior of other investors in the market. Right? And, and so you're trying to create these corners and you're trying not to be influenced by others who are creating the corners. That's what investment meant before World War II. And that's how these guys made their fortunes. Now it changes after World War II where and there are a lot of reasons for this. It's taking investments from Wall Street to Main Street Merrill and the thundering herd and you know trying to find a rationale to sell it and so we we scientificized investing uh, which totally has a role but I think what we've lost is the, this notion of the, the, the game play uh, that in poker there's a saying you know you don't just play the cards it's not just the fundamentals but you also have to play the players and uh, playing the player is what these guys did really well and it's what the game of markets meant. And I think there's a role to try to bring all this back together now. But let's, let's be clear, the street has never lost the plot here. The street has always known how much money there is to be made from creating stories and having all of us respond positively to it. Because we're looking around at the crowd and saying, oh, okay. So what I've got here, before 2003, it was, it was, a, it was a wonderful uh, money-making operation that the street had. So you had guys like here on the left, Henry Blodgett. He was the axe, the star analyst for Merrill on uh, technology stocks. 
So he would write puff pieces about pets.com or, or what have you. Uh, Merrill paid him a lot of money, about two and a half million dollars a year. This is in the, the, the late 1990s, early 2000s. You know, a sell side analyst today, you can't sniff, you know, 250 grand, you're, you're, you're doing well. They're paying uh, Blodgett and some of the other star analysts, you know, two and a half, three million dollars a year. They were doing that because Henry Blodgett, by the stories he would tell, generated enormous revenues for the Wall Street banks in their investment banking business. With the IPOs, with the secondaries, with the sale of stock for these high-flying stuff, for these high-flying companies, right? That's, uh, that's Frank Quattrone. Now, there are people in this room who are old enough, I mean, you remember these guys, right? Uh, Frank Quattrone, who's on that investment banking side, and uh, it was a great little system, right? Where the stories that Wall Street would create through research would get paid off through the investment banking uh, revenues that, that all the big banks uh, reveled in, right? uh, Until Elliott comes along, uh, Elliot Spitzer comes along in 2003 and blows it all up. You know, as, as always, the problem is when you write this stuff down. Right? So Blodgett you know, famously wrote a couple of bad emails. Don't write it down. Don't do it in emails. Right? Where he said, man, I can't believe you guys have got me vlogging this really crappy company, but okay, I'll do it because we need to get the, the IPO here, the secondary. And so Elliot, who was the Attorney General of New York at the time, Oh, sorry, the, the, the uh, prosecutor for the federal, federal uh, district. You see billions, right? That, 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 there's an Elliot Spitzer character for you. Uh, he, he blows it all up. And so the, the, the banks have to pay, I think it was like four or five billion dollars in fines back when, you know, a billion dollars actually meant something. And they create this, they, they create a now Chinese wall where research and banking, investment banking, have to be separate. They can't talk to each other. That's the system, of course, we still have today. Uh, Henry Blodgett is barred for life from the securities industry. Uh, Frank Quattrone spends a couple of weeks in the big house uh, in prison. Uh, but don't feel too badly for them, right? So, so Blodgett uh, goes on to start Business Insider, uh, which he sold about three years ago to a German publisher for over $500 million. Uh, Frank, he got his conviction not just overturned, but expunged. And so he's running his own private equity shop now, and uh, they're both really happy and really rich. I just think it's fair to say they're doing better than Elliot is, 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 is doing today. <laughs> but of course, the street, when you've got this, this, this I, when you know how effective it is to create stories and make money from it, all right, the investment banking avenue broke down. So what has the street done since 2003? Well, this is what the street does. This is the fake news, the, present, the presentation of opinion as fact that drives the street today and drives the research that, that we all read, that we all read from the street. And so the revenue for the street now is through trading volume. That's why they write these reports. That's why they give them to you for free. Right? It's because what they're trying to do is you say, say, hmm, I should buy some of that stock for my client. That's a good story. I like that. Right? Now, there's no need now for a star system, right? Because you, these, these are the new cogs. This is the new boiler room, right? Where you pay these guys not a lot of money. There may be some here in this room for all I know, right? Where you're sitting there and every day, I gotta write another story. I gotta write another story. And typically what you see is you, you're gonna write stories about companies that, where it's easier to write stories. Uh, those tend to be technology, media, uh, telecoms, right? Where there's no, fundamentals that really drive what the story is going to be. Now, so here's my um, poster child for how all this works. Uh, and the company is salesforce.com. That's the CEO, Mark Benioff, there uh, on, the, on, on the upper left. Now, salesforce.com, this is not a large cap tech company. This is a mega cap tech company, with a market cap of, of, of well north of $100 billion. It's also a company that has never, ever, never, ever, never had a single penny of gap earnings. Not a single penny. Right? And because of their business model, which we can go into detail later, they never will. They never will have a single penny of gap earnings. To which you say, well, if you're Mark Benioff, well, why should we? <laughs> right? 
This has worked out better than you can possibly imagine. And here's how it works out. What Salesforce.com is evaluated on, it's not gap earnings, not gap anything. The metric for Salesforce.com is pro forma net revenue growth. And I have no idea what the hell that means, right? right? So it's not just, it's not, just, not just revenue growth, it's not just net revenue growth, whatever that means, it's pro forma net revenue growth. And amazingly enough, the company beats and raises its guidance on pro forma net revenue growth almost every quarter. Amazing, right? What, 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 what a miracle. What a miracle. So there are four days of theater for Salesforce.com, uh, the four earnings announcements. And on the, Benny has been doing this for the last 10 years, so the last 40 earnings announcements. He appears on Kramer four times a year, the night of his earnings announcements. So they tell the story of pro forma net revenue growth. Killer, really good. We're going to raise our guidance on that. Effect. And of course, Kramer goes, bye, bye, bye. But most importantly, you have the same four or five analysts from the major banks who write their piece and publish it before the market opens the next day to tell all of us that A, what you should be looking at, look at, look at pro forma net revenue growth. Because that's how you need to think about this company. That's how you should think about the company. That's what those analyst reports do. The street loves it, the way these guys get paid or their bosses get paid, because trading volume in Salesforce.com the day after the earnings announcement is typically 20 to 30x the, the average daily volume. Right? It drives trading volume for the whole year, these stories that are created. Uh, how does it work for investors? Well, that's the chart I've got there on the right. So just over a five-year period of time, and it, I've, I've got it to the more recent. It's exactly the same. It's actually a little more pronounced. So that gold line there is if you owned Salesforce.com stock for one day, 12 times a year. There are 12 days of theater. There are the four days of theater for the company, and there are the eight days of theater for the Federal Reserve. There are eight times a year where the Federal Reserve has a press conference and shakes their finger at you, whoever the Fed chair is, to tell you how to think about the world. So I just want to own the stock for the one day after earnings. I'm going to buy it at the close, and I'm going to sell it to the next day's close. Ditto with the Fed uh, earnings announcement, uh, the Fed earnings announcement, the, the Fed eight times a year uh, FOMC meeting conferences. And I just own it for those 12 days a year over this five-year period. I'm up 170%. If I own the stock for the other 230 or 240 trading days a year, I'm down 10%. That's just the fact. And what I'll also tell you is that every company in the S&P 500 has a chart that looks something like that. Every single one. Now this is my poster child, right? You've got some companies that the way that the street drives trading volume is to have a very negative message on it. IBM's a great example. I want to own IBM except for the days of theater. Because the, the way that, and, and, you can, and I'll show you later how we can actually measure this stuff, right? The way that the street drives volume on, on IBM is to tell you, oh my god, another disastrous quarter. What the hell are these guys doing? They don't know what they're doing. Right? And so that's how they, they drive the trading volume. So it's not only just positive narratives, although positive narratives dominate because everyone loves a positive story. You've got a few occasional negative stories. But every company in the S&P 500 has got a, a chart that looks something like that. The entire S&P 500 does. That's, that's the fake news in action today. And we all think we're immune to it, uh, but we're not. We're not. This is why most tech companies actually report their earnings now after the close. It wasn't always this way. In fact, if you go back you know, 10, 20, 20 years ago, most companies, and a lot of industrial companies still do this, they report their earnings the morning right before the market opens. In fact, you still have some companies. It was not uncommon 20 years ago for companies to report their earnings in the middle of the trading day. But this change, and it really changed particularly with the tech stocks, these story-driven stocks, because it gives time then, you know, not just up here on Kramer, but again, more importantly, it gives time for the analysts to write their reports and publish them, and for all of us to read them before the market opens the next day. They can shake their fingers at us, and we always respond. This is the, the French uh, president 
George Clemenceau after World War I, and his, you know, his famous comment where the politician said, yeah, war is too important to be left to the generals. We can't make that mistake again. And my, my strong view is that what I call a team elite, which certainly includes the politicians today, but also the central bankers, CEOs like Mark Benioff, the Wall Street firms, their view is that markets are too important to be left to investors. And so they've got this great system of shaking their finger at us, and we are hardwired to respond to it. I will make one more point about Salesforce.com. Mark Benioff has got a 10B51 plan. So many of you here are familiar, if, if you're senior management, an insider at a publicly traded company, you can't just say, oh, I want to sell some of my stock today. Uh, if, you're, if you're going to do it on a regular basis, you have to file a plan with the SEC where you say, here's when I'm going to, to, to sell my stock on these very regular uh, intervals. And so uh, yeah, I think Salesforce.com stock is like 130, 135 bucks today. Uh, Mark Benioff sells 12,500 shares of CRM stock. CRM is the ticker, Salesforce.com stock. He doesn't do it every quarter. He doesn't do it every month. He does it every trading day. So every day that the market is open, Mark Benioff sells 12,500 shares of stock. Mark Benioff is not just a multi-billionaire. He's liquid, right? It, I mean, hats off, right? So, so this guy and guys like him, right? They are the Carnegie's and the Ghouls and the Vanderbilt's of our day. It's just a different game we're playing today. You know, I, I was giving this presentation to a, a, a large university endowment to their, uh, to their board. And we were, they had the meeting out in San Francisco. So this is one of these long boardroom tables, right? I'm giving this spiel and I'm, giving, I'm sailing along with this. And I, and I see a hand raise at the, at the, the, the end of the, the table. I say, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. And uh, I says, um, son, he called me son, right? So I, I happen to be the uh, lead independent director for Salesforce.com. <laughs> At which moment I have an out-of-body experience, right? So I, 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 you know, my, I feel my ears turning red. You know, I, I feel the blood rushing up here. I, I'm literally floating above the table for a second. Like, well, this is how my career ends. Great. Okay. It's, it's, it's good to know. And I start yammering something about, well, well you've got great free cash flow. And, you know, it's, you know. and he says, no, no, relax. It's exactly like that. <laughs> because every year the board reloads him. The board reloads Mark Benny up with more stock to sell. So 12,500 shares every trading day. That's how the game works today. All right, so what I want to say is, well, what can we do about it? Right? We're not going to change the system. But what we can do is each of us become armed Right, to, to, to do better for ourselves and for our clients. So what I want to do is try to talk about some of the new tools that are available to us. Just like, just like Leland Stanford got the stop action photography to understand how a market, how a horse runs, well, let's use some of the same technology that we have available to us today, that we all have available to us today, to try to get a better sense of how market runs, to try to understand and visualize the creation of these narratives and people shaking their finger. And there are a couple of different, um, I've got providers of this, people who can give this sort of technology. I'm not asking everyone to go out and become an AI expert, right? But there's a particularly branch of artificial intelligence called natural language processing, NLP. And this is one company we use that licenses this, this, this sort of technology. You know, a lot of people do this now or can make this stuff available. And what it does is it's, it's, it's ideas that have been around for like 20 years, but now we've got enough processing power to really make it work. And the way that this artificial intelligence works is that it reads. But it doesn't read like you and I do sequentially, right? It can read 1,000, 10,000 articles all at the same time and compare every word in every article and every grammatical structure in every article to every other word in every other grammatical structure in every article in like a second and a half. I mean, it, it, it's really hard for the, the human brain to, to, to wrap its head around this, to get, to, to get around this, but that's what the, the processing power is today. And what it creates is 
it, it reminds me of like a star map because it really does use a, a gravity model that the more similar the two articles are in their word choice and the grammar and the way they're written, the ideas that they're expressing, the more they'll pull together, the more they'll cluster together, the stronger a gravity they'll have. And the more different they are, the more they push each other apart. And so what you end up with, this is something we did for one of our, our family office clients. Uh, they're uh, a, a Mexican family office uh, based in Monterey. We said, well, you know, exam give us the narrative map visualize for us the story about Mexico in the financial media. So we took this over some six month period of time, every Bloomberg article that ever mentioned Mexico in it, run it through, put it under this microscope, it really is like this, a new kind of camera, let's call it, and you get this, right? So what is this? Well, you know, this is showing the, the, the clusters of different types of articles. And what's important here is distance and geography. So that the, the language that's being used about the Mexican uh, TMT, technology, media, and telecom sector, the pharma sector, the construction sector, very different from the language that's being used for the peso or rates or oil. You say, okay, I, I guess I get that. Where, where, how does that make a difference? Well, here. Now let's color these articles, not by just what cluster they're in, but by the sentiment, whether they're saying positive things or negative things. And now what you see, and you can, you can really visualize it for the first time, is that, well, there's a real difference in the story around the Mexican market. This is extremely, this was, we did this when the, the Mexican market was really taking a nosedive. And you see, actually the story around these domestic sectors, uh, there on the left-hand side, it's actually quite positive. Whereas a very negative story with anything over there on the, on, on the right-hand side. You know, we also talk about value investing. You hear Charlie Munger talk about this and others about a, a, a margin of safety in value investing. Well, what I want to suggest to you is that we can think about margin of safety, not just from the fundamentals, but also think about the margin of safety that exists in the stories, in the narratives, and how the missionaries are shaking their finger at us. So it gave you know, our, this family also a lot more confidence to buy the Mexican market, but in these sectors where there was a positive story. We were able to visualize that for the first time. Now I'll give you a, a, a really uh, a recent uh, study that, that I did on this. And, and here I'm, I'm interested in talking about the inflation Right, so, so what is the, how are people shaking their fingers at us about inflation? Right, because that's, that's, that's the killer, right, certainly for our fixed income investments. Uh, the whole notion of, 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 of a rising rate environment is something that you know, I'm going to suggest most people in this room have never had to deal with. Right, and even those who have, right, you know, it's been 30 some odd years since you really had to exercise or flex your inflation investment muscles. So it's, it's, it's important. But, but this is, this again, from Bloomberg articles, everything that talks about inflation over an entire year, from April 2016 to April 2017. And what you see, this is a classic complacent, eh, it's not really, it's not really a, a well-formed narrative picture. Right? Again, geography is important here, the, the, the geometry. What you see is that all these articles are there on the periphery of this star map, right? Meaning they're not central. They're not exhibiting really gravity. And if you actually read any of these articles, they're not really about inflation. They're about Donald Trump or they're about the Fed and, and inflation is going to be impacted, blah, 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 right? Inflation is, is not central to the article. But it's a, it's a really kind of a throwaway. It doesn't have a lot of gravity. Now here's the map for the most recent year. And this is one of the most uh, incredible transformations I've seen in a narrative. I've been doing this for a while now. and doing this studies on a lot of stuff that I've ever seen. Right? So, so over the past year, the narrative, the story about inflation has absolutely become a front and center market narrative. Uh, this is colored by recency, so the redder the dot, the more recent it is. So not only do you now have these articles now at the heart of the narrative map, 
right? But they're, they're, they tend to be redder dots, and things are moving towards over time. If you were to take kind of a stop action fo photograph of this, you'd see it both growing and moving more towards the center of the map. That's telling me that this is growing in power and strength, the narrative around inflation. And it means that all of us are looking around at all of us and saying, is inflation here? Are you worried about inflation? I'm starting to get a little worried about you. you? We're all, the crowd is now looking at the crowd on the subject of inflation. Why does this matter? It matters because it's this question of timing. Unless there's a narrative to support something, it ain't going to happen. Right? You could have had hot inflation numbers that pop up. Some did, right, during April 2016 to April 2017. Died without a trace because there was no fertile soil, narrative soil, for those seeds to be dropped into. Today, on the other hand, if we get a hot inflation number, first Friday of some month, we get a wage inflation number of more than 3%, or we get a hot CPI number at some point, and we will, just by the randomness and the way in which these numbers are constructed, well, that's going to be a freak out moment for markets. It's going to be an absolute freak out moment for markets. It's what we saw in the first week in February, where the, the market freak out for about three days there was after we got a hot wage inflation number was always about the first Friday of each month. So what, what we've really seen develop here, and it, it, we're, we're visualizing this, I, I think, for the first time, is where you can see not a horse gallop, but you're seeing the way that sentiment and narrative can actually form in markets and figure out how that needs to inform what we do in our investing. And what I want to conclude with this is, right, is that, well, what do you do? And I, I'm not suggesting everyone in here has to become an AI expert and, you know, you know track the narratives and stuff. What, we, what, what you need to do is just not be the sucker at the table. Because there's that old poker saying, right, that if you've been playing poker for 30 minutes and you don't know who the sucker is at the table, it's you. <laughs> What, what, what I'm suggesting is that just by thinking about markets in this terms, thinking honestly about markets and the way that quality hasn't worked for nine years, and why is that? Yes, it's all the money that's flooded markets, but it's also how now everyone shakes their finger at us all the time. That if we're just aware of that, then it, I promise you it will make an enormous difference about how you hear the world. It'll make an enormous difference for your portfolio and your clients' portfolios to not be the sucker at the table. So when you know Uncle Wilbur you know, goes on CNBC and holds up his Campbell soup can, he did this when the, the, uh, the White House first announced uh, steel and aluminum pairs. And he got on there and he held up his Campbell soup can and said, oh, you know, not going to have any impact. You know, it's like one quarter of one cent of steel in this in this, in this camp, soup can. What, what you recognize is what, what Wilbur is really doing there. He's shaking his finger at you. Right? He's trying to tell you how to think about tariffs and quotas and like. What I'm saying is, you're smart enough to make up your own damn mind. Right? It doesn't mean you have to fight the Fed or fight the White House or go against it, but you understand what's going on. You're being played. And that's fine. We're all being played all the time. It's, it's, it's the world we live in. But what, what, what I think really damages investors and portfolios is when you believe it in your heart of hearts. Uh, and that, that's what I'm suggesting you not do. I think what it means for our portfolios is, is what I call profoundly agnostic portfolios, where we're aware that these narratives are being created. And we're aware, and I, I know this is really hard to, to Accept. It took me a lot of years to accept it, but to understand that notions like quality, that's just a narrative. That's just a story we've been told. Um, it's a bias we have, and I understand why we have it. And maybe in private markets, it's more than just a, a, a bias. It's more than just a narrative. But in the public markets we've got today, yeah, we've got to know the fundamentals, but we really need to be aware of how narratives are creating, how we're all hardwired to respond to them so we can do a better job for our clients. All right, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, as you can tell, I love to talk about this stuff.
Right. So um, drop me an email and we can carry on to continue the conversation. I write about this stuff on epsilontheory.com. There, by now I think we've got like 200 notes on subjects like this. It's all free, of course, and it's uh, the, the the way it's used by most people is to to arm advisors and investors to have better conversations with their clients. That's what I'm trying to do in these presentations. That's what we write about. And thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Do we have time for a, a couple of questions, or is just okay, great? So, I, yes, sir, in the in, in the back there. Yes, yes, sir. I'll, I'll try to speak up. Thank you, Ben. That was very good. I guess to welcome you to the South. Bayon, thank you. Bayon, that's right. Um, it's interesting because, in a very real sense, you didn't give us data. You told us stories about stories and said, "Don't trust the stories." Yeah, so like, I'm an effective story. I'm a good story. missionary. I'm a missionary. Yeah. Yeah. Have a story for yeah. Bayer, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why anybody would expect quality to outperform them. It's not hard to hold. It, it, that would require the whole market to say, I don't like quality for some reason. I'm not going to own it. That makes it outperform. I'm not sure why anybody would think a priori that if I buy this stuff with Porter's balance sheet, with high profit margins, with whatever, that's going to be better than the other stuff. That would assume people are incredibly stupid and don't, don't recognize that these are good companies. I, I, is that really right? I, I mean, when I, when I think about the companies I want to own, when I when I read the stories and I talk to financial advice, everyone wants a story about I want to buy a good company. I, I want to buy a good company. Everybody wants to own it. It should be priced to have low acceptance. Well, well, you know, it, it is interesting. So, so this 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 index that the Deutsche Bank created, they created back in 2000, and what you see, and I, I should put in the slide but before March of 2009, quality does outperform. Quality works from 2000 to March of 2009. Market neutral quality, it really works. Now, we had as you, we had the the dot com bust, right? And it really worked then. Quality really worked the dot com bust. But interesting, it did okay. And this is market neutral. Market neutral. It did okay in the market recovery between call it you know summer of 2002, call it 2003 to 2008. Now, again, when markets collapsed in 2008, again, quality rocked. Market neutral quality did really did, did well, made money, right? So over that nine year period of time before this, market neutral quality was up 75%. The S&P 500, and again, it's the dates when they start this, which is like February of 2000, S&P 500 was down 50%, right? So, my point, and, and I, I hear you, and I, and I think that's such an important one about what's priced into the market. But when we think about all these quality, these factors, right, we think that there's a risk premium. There should be a benefit to owning quality. In the same way that value investors think there should be a value, there should be a reward for owning that, that value factor. And I, I would suggest you're the rarity, right, in most of the CFA talks I give, to, to, and I agree with you. It gets, gets priced in. Yeah. You guys yeah. just made my point. If quality does better in bad times, it should have a low expected return, not a high one. It's an insurance hedge. I should own that regardless no, of low expected No, no, it, it, it's not just that it did particularly well in bad times, right? It also performed well. It also performed well in good times. Before March of 2009, this, 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 this has never happened before, right? And, and again, if I put up a value, a, a, a value, Factor here, it'd be, it'd be it'd be even worse, right? Uh, this has never happened before, and, and I really do think it's two things, right? One is the wall of money, which is also new, the twenty trillion dollars that's new, and also the use of these these, these words. Um, so, I mean, it, it it goes back to the notion of, of of do you believe that there's any way to outperform the market, right? So if if you just think, well, I'm just going to own the broad market. Period, end of story. I just want beta and I want to harvest that as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. I get it. I think that should be the, the framework of most, most portfolios. But I do believe that everyone in this room, I'm suspecting, maybe not a few people, right, believe that alpha, that outperformance is possible. And I'll be hard pressed to find anyone who believes that you're going to outperform under any circumstances by owning crap. Um, 
And I think most people, including myself, have a bias towards quality as a way that that's how you generate market beating performance. I own the good companies. And that, that connection between good company and outperformance, alpha, that's what's been broken here. That's what's not showing here. I'll ask our illustrious award winner. Great, great question. Right. What what I'm interested in, right, are the is the is the narratives in which we as professional investors swim. And for professional investors, you can really measure this, right? That, that there are four megaphones that matter. Right? There's Bloomberg, there's the Wall Street Journal, there's CNBC and particularly for anything outside the US, the Financial Times. That's it. And what I mean by the megaphone that matters okay. is that if, if something appears in Bloomberg, and this is what com common knowledge is not something that we all know. What common knowledge is is something that we all think that everyone else believes. That's what common knowledge is. And the way it's crea created is this is the crowd looking at the crowd. When we as professional investors, if we see that something's been published on Bloomberg, or CNBC, or said on CNBC, or the Journal, or the FT, we all believe that every other professional investor has also seen it. That's why those are the four megaphones that matter for the narratives that impact us. What, what I have done in some other writing is look at some political narratives, right? And there, I absolutely am looking way beyond you know, the, the, the financial news networks. But, but this was specifically designed to, what are, what are the stories that everyone is shaking their finger at us as professional investors about? That's why we've got Bloomberg. Yes, sir. You said, I thought during your talk, you said you were going to say something about the test line. That always amuses me, so. Well, so today, uh, Elon Musk had a shareholder meeting, right? So that's another one of these days of theater, uh, in addition to the earnings announcement, is your, your, your shareholder meeting. And so you may be aware, so, so Musk is I'm not going to take questions anymore from the sell side analysts, many of whom have a negative story now about Tesla. So he got, of the, the questions he answered at the, at the shareholder meeting today, they came from Twitter. They were questions that were tweeted in for him. And so some enterprise, a young soul, you should measure this stuff too, went and looked at the accounts where those Twitter questions came in. And there were 11 Twitter questions. Seven of them were clearly bots that had just been created just for this purpose, right? They had like two followers, or you know, and they just been around for like you know, a couple of weeks. And the questions were set up, the questions they asked were of course designed for Elon to give a very positive answer because he knew what the questions were going to be. He knew how he wanted to answer them because he wanted to create a narrative about you know, Model 3 production and no, we don't need new financing. Why would you think we need new financing? Just because we've got X billions of dollars of debt coming in. And you saw what happened with the stock today. The stock was up 10%. Right. So it's, this is what a, an effective CEO has to do today. I, I mean, look, credit work, hats off to, 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 to Elon because he's, he knows how to play this game like Benioff does. What an effective CEO has to do today it's not so much, I, I think, <laughs> what you do kind of internally and you're a good leader. Like, it's, do you know how to play this game? And you've got guys like Benioff, and you've got guys like Elon Musk, and you've got people like don't run IBM, who are very bad, because that's part of the problem, that the, that the CEOs we've had at IBM have not been good at playing this game. If you want your stock price to go up, which all these guys do, this is the game you've got to play today. And, uh, and we saw it in live action today, really the creation of a narrative. And it worked. Not because anybody thought, oh, well, now I believe Elon where I didn't believe him before. 
but it's because you look around and you say, well, this is getting reported on Bloomberg and CNBC. Everybody's seeing it. If I'm short, I need to cover, right? Because whether I believe it or not, I think everyone else has heard it. That's how common knowledge, that's, that's how the crowd watching the crowd, how it, how it, how it plays out. And we saw it today, 10%, 10% up today. Yes, sir. Let's talk about other narratives that you think are important. I mean, I hear about the oil story. I mean, everybody talks about oil. And after inflation, I mean, how do I know which story is going to dominate which story? If I say the narrative for this looks this way, your narrative for something else, I mean, the trade and tariff narrative, narrative Right. It's a big one. It's huge. To be overcoming the inflation. Well, they, they, they go back and forth, for sure. The, the reason I focus on inflation is that my, my strong belief is that uh, for a family office, for an, uh, uh, an endowment, a foundation, for a, a, a client uh, who wants to preserve their wealth, the, one, the, the only thing you've got to get right is the inflation question. I, I really believe that. That's the, that's the only question. If you, if you just get that one right, and, and, and you don't have to be exactly on the timing, just get, get the inflation question roughly right, and you'll be fine. You will be fine. If you get it wrong, right, inflation, if you get that inflation question wrong in your portfolio, that's, that, that's, that's the killer. So, so that's why I picked this. Now, your question is, it's liver, so, you know, we'll, we've got all these different narratives that, 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 that come up. But you'll get it. Once, once you start now looking at, well, it's not what people are saying, right? It's not the facts that are happening. The way I, 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 have to, I bet it, so many people in this room will, will read the news differently tomorrow. And they'll ask this question. Why are they running this story? Why now? Why now is there a story about trade or the like. Why, why, why is the White House bringing this up as an issue now? And it's part of what I'm describing as that critical thinking, that, that, that it really will help you see the world differently. And you can measure this stuff. I mean, I, I try to measure, it's like stop action photography, not of a horse runs, but how these different narratives grow, wax and wane. I did something yesterday, we were talking about you know, larger political questions. When you look at the, 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 the way in which narratives uh, develop, die down, and the like, you know, they're like, they have a lifespan. Stories come, they flare up, and then they die down. And you saw this in most cases with the, uh, the, the Trump-Clinton election, with one exception, and that exception was emails. The emails narrative around the Clinton campaign. And it's the damnedest thing where it never died down. It never died down. And it when you, when you think about the way these narratives are constructed, it requires missionaries, it requires somebody shaking a finger, it requires the, the megaphone to have it. You think differently about this stuff. It's not that, that emails weren't a big deal. I think they were a big deal. But it made an enormous difference in the election. I, my view, way outsized to what it actually was compared to so many of the other issues on both sides that you could claim. So you, you, you really can track this stuff and just by having this, 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 this sensitivity to it, to think critically about it, it you, you'll find that it changes your, 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 uh, your sense of, of how you're being played and, and, and your role out there. Yes, sir. So in your work, excuse me, in your work, do uh, you believe the truth prevails or just the narrative become the truth? So I, I used to be, you know, we talk about informational efficiency of markets and you're talking about you've got a, uh, you know, you may be a believer in strong informational efficiency for markets, semi-strong or weak informational efficiency of markets. And at first I was, a, I was a weak believer in the narrative driver of markets, right? Yeah, you know, the truth will out ultimately in life. Then I became kind of semi-strong. At this point now, I'm now a believer in the strong narrative theory, theory of markets. That this, where quality doesn't matter, I think I can go on forever. I think that that's exactly what, again, I call it team elite, what, what, what I believe that it would be very useful for politicians to turn capital markets into a political utility, where you don't have volatility, right? 
where you don't have big ups or downs, but where you have just a small, steady increase. I, I think that that's exactly, if not the intentional goal, at least the unintentional goal. And uh, I think unless we're able, and I think this happens in a grassroots way, which is why I'd like to talk about this stuff, unless we can all develop this kind of sensitivity and critical thinking about this, I think this stuff can go on for a really, really, really long time. Yes, sir? So let's take a narrative that you can't beat the market, indexing is here, and active management is dead. How would you go about measuring that narrative and whether it's succeeding or not? Is there a way to do that? Well, I, I mean, I'm, it's I'm succeeding, like right, from our, from our, you know, everyone in, you know, our business models will tell us it's succeeding, right, that that, that, that narrative is, is, is so pronounced, right, and you see it everywhere. Um, so when you, when you do kind of the study of kind of what, what are the, the narratives and how they've grown over the last years, the whole notion about passive investment and the like, that's right in the middle of the chart and it's big and it's bright and it's, and it's, and it's very powerful. Right? What I can't tell you is why narratives change. It depends on what missionaries come up and what their, their goals are. You know, why has trade come up you know, as, a, as a political issue and now as an economic issue? I think it because, it's because this White House recognizes that it's a very powerful political position to take. That whatever the economic consequences are, that's how you're going to win in 2020, is to stake this out. And, and so I, I think that there, there are a lot of motivations, right? So, so I'll give you an answer for, for, for how the, the, the passive investment you know, narrative has grown. I mean, you can look at all the, the stuff that, that Vanguard puts out. I mean, my God, you don't think they're an active participant in you know, putting out a message? They're, and, and look, hats off to them. It's like Elon Musk and, and, and Mark Benioff. They understand the role that creating and promulgating a narrative plays today. That it ain't the truth with a capital T. That it's not the fundamentals as much as it is, can I create a story and shake my finger at you and say it loudly enough and longly enough because you'll believe it. So we've got one more question, one and then we'll see. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you are sitting in front of the town hall and you've got all this unstructured data, would you have to go to the You wait for it. You got it. There's no human bias to set this up. The machine does this without any human intervention. That, that's what's so powerful about it. So it's got, so every piece of data is assigned some kind of weight. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how it works. And it's, it's, it's phenomenal. It really is like, you know, you just invented uh, a, a, like the microscope where you put a glass of dirty water from the River Thames underneath it, right? You go, oh my God, there's a whole world alive in there. It's just like that. And uh, again, this is something that's being used against us. And so, at least in some small way, this is something we can all do, is try to arm ourselves and arm our clients to try to be more resistant to it. And so I'll be around all the time, so, but, but I, I, think, I think I'm getting the hook here. So, so, so thanks for all very much.